Okay, got that. He lay and listened to the far off sea and seemed to hear it surging overhead. Already though it was full an hour or more until high tide when Solway's shining flood should sweep the shallow firth from shore to shore. He felt a salty tingle in his blood and seemed to stifle drowning. Then again, he knew that he must lie a lingering while before the sea might close upon his pain. Although the advancing waves had scarce a mile to travel, creeping nearer inch by inch with little runs and sallies over the sand. And the second one is uh, from Praetoria by John Ruskin. The whole glory and blessing of these sacred coasts, depending on the rise and fall of their eternal sea, over sand gilded with its withdrawing glow, from the measureless distances of the west, on the ocean horizon, or veiled in silvery mists, or shadowed with fast flying storm. And so it was by this vast expanse of water, a water that covers and envelops, that the largest munitions factory in the world at the time was built. You can see uh, some of the extent of it on these Google Maps, which stretches nine miles from Donegal in Scotland to Mossbank in Cumbria, and produced two purpose-built towns in Eastrix and Gretna, which housed the thousands of workers, who were mainly women, who worked in the factories making the munitions. And the explosive used at the time was called cordite, a smokeless powder which was produced in long, thin strands to be loaded into shells and rifle cartridges. But the process of making cordite involved cooking up the volatile viscous gloop in huge vats, described by the writer Arthur Conan Doyle as the devil's porridge. And I feel like for some of you, this will not be new information at all, but for those of you who asked me, what the hell is devil's porridge, this is your answer. And the factory was built as a response to the arms crisis in 1915, which saw Britain's firepower severely curtailed by sluggish munitions production. Built over the course of six months by 10,000 Irish navvies, by 1917, it was churning out 800 tons of cordite a week. And this played a huge part in the eventual victory for the allied powers in 1918. So the site for the munitions factory, which is codenamed Moorside, was chosen for its isolated location on the Solway Fir. The area was sparsely populated, but it had excellent transport links due to proximity to Glasgow and the northwest of England. It was also far enough away from mainland Europe to thwart a Luftwaffe strike or a Zeppelin attack, and mines in the surrounding area provided raw materials. But the landscape itself also played a key role in the decision to place the explosive factory there. The low-lying hills that surrounded the region and the humidity of the estuary meant that the site was often shrouded in mist, which was ideal for keeping it hidden. And mean, meanwhile, the tides of the Solway provided not only a supply of water, but was also a convenient place to dump waste. And a document that I found in the Devil's Porridge Museum archives confirmed that untreated waste was pumped directly into the estuary. And by building the factory di directly next to the shore, the undulating nature of the tides blurred the boundaries between land and water, factory and shoreline. And in her paper, Slippery Ontologies of Tidal Flats, the scholar Young Ray Choi speaks, to, speaks of the in-betweenness of tidal flats, stating, in our geographic imaginary, between land and sea, however, fails to recognize the port, sorry, the boundaries between land and sea are often thought of as a line. This long-standing binary, however, fails to recognize the porousness, dynamics, and multiplicity of the spaces between land and sea. In this imaginary, the in-between zones characterized by an ever-changing interplay of land and water are rendered invisible. The Gretna munitions factory shaped and was shaped by the rise and fall of the Solway waters, but the land itself, partitioned by MOB fences, presents a physical boundary between the shore and land. And as I found firsthand scrambling over collapsed brickwork, knee deep in undergrowth, at times clinging to the wire mesh to stop myself from slipping onto the beach with its incoming tide. And the boundary is encapsulated quite nicely in yet another poem. And this one is something I found from a commemorative annual written at the winding down of the factory in 1918. This lonesome flats by saline breezes swept, home of the raucous gull and nimble hare, by worries old and bobbies once kept inviolate as Dora's self, for there, within a barbed fence, eight feet or more, a trousered throng of lasses fair and free of speech assembled, and each day incorporated umpteen tons of RDP. 
RDB being the explosives that they were making. So after the war, the MID attempted to sell the land. This is from the um, auction papers. And they even contacted several of the wealthiest people in Britain with a right of purchase. But the site and its infrastructure, which included the town of East Riggs, was just too huge for anyone to take on. And today the Longtown site is still in operation as a storage facility, but the rest has been mothballed for decades. And to walk around the perimeter is to be warned in no uncertain terms not to trespass on MOD property. But you also can't fail to notice the abundance of wildlife deer, rabbits, foxes, and all manner of birds. And I spoke to Gordon Rutledge, who's the former head of the factory floor at Longtown and is now a local historian. And he recounted the frequent encounters with animals and birds during his tenure and how the mothballed sites have almost been reclaimed by nature. The good thing about these military sites and these shooting ranges and places, there's a lot of conservation that goes on by the shore. Even we had, although it was an, an ammunition depot, we used to feed deer and things. There was a herd of deer in there, and there's still some at East Riggs, and feed the wild birds. So even though there were shooters at the time, there, were also, there was also conservation. The foundations of the old laboratories were flooded, and there were fish in there. There were all sorts of butterflies, birds' nests everywhere, so it was ideal for conservation. And I mean, the ammunition business didn't really disturb the wildlife they could survive next to each other. Wildlife and the ammunition business have survived next to each other for a long time on the Solway. And despite the bounded spaces of the factory and other military infrastructures in the area, these boundaries are frequently transgressed by non-humans. Just like the tides, such spaces might be conceived of as in-between zones, places that resist categorization or spatial fixity. But for me, the main reason that brought me to the Solway was the geese, the barnacle geese specifically. And so the barnacle goose is a medium sized goose with black, white and gray body and a white face. And they received the name since their origin was deemed a mystery to the medieval folk who claimed that the geese must have hatched from barnacles as no chicks had ever been seen. And another explanation was the barnacle goose tree upon which the geese ripened like fruits and dropped to the ground like apples. And so pervasive was this myth that Pope Innocent III hosted a council debate on whether the goose should be classed as a bird or a fish, or even a fruit, I guess. And if it was the latter, was it permissible to eat during Lent when all meat should be avoided? And later Pope Pius II traveled to Scotland and attempted to hunt down the barnacle goose tree. But every person he asked directed him further and further north until he was told the tree was located in Orkney and he gave up. So my hunt for the goose was a little more successful, although the first one I saw was dead. She was lying on the beach, surrounded by shells and bricks stamped with the Buccleuch terracotta works name. And the current Duke of Buccleuch is the largest landowner in Scotland's already vastly unequal land ownership network, although his reach doesn't extend to the Solway. Land ownership here largely comprises Ministry of Defence Lands and the stewardship of Lady Clare Care. But the Solway coast itself, including the beach where I found the dead Barney, is covered through a patchwork of marine protection orders and conservation zones. Due to devolution, Scotland administers different conservation bodies to that of England, but together they form the Solway Firth Partnership that recognises the transient and dy dynamic nature of the wildlife there that does not correspond to borders and boundaries. The Barneys themselves roost on the English side of the Solway and fly across the Firth to feed on the Scottish side. I don't know how the barnacle goose on the beach died, but a reserve manager at Calaverock Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust later tells me it is rare to find a barney dead from natural causes. More likely, this particular goose died from avian influenza. And the reason I don't refer to avian flu as natural is because it isn't. As a virus, it emerged in the mid 1990s from a commercial goose farm and spread into the wild bird population. And various outbreaks have occurred since then, but the current outbreak that has devastated seabird and goose populations since 2021, it seems to be less deadly than the others, but in turn is able to travel further and infect wider. In the winter of 2021, the world's barnacle goose population suffered losses of around a third. And on the Solway itself, that meant 16,000 geese perished. I came to the Solway just as winter was beginning in 2022. 
the atmosphere was uneasy. Could such devastation happen again? And as I came to the end of my walk, I picked up on rumblings of worry. An interview was canceled because the person in question had to attend a meeting with the Scottish government over their avian flu response. More barnacle geese were found dead. And whilst this year's outbreak hasn't been nearly as devastating as last year's so far anyway, the situation for wild birds remains critical and will continue to do so while the so-called boundaries separating wild birds from domestic birds are blurred and fuzzy. Wild birds here are unwitting vectors of the virus, aided by the freedom of flight and non-captivity, and are not invasive transmitters as they are so often constructed by the media. And the Solway Barnies, of course, do not hatch from barnacles, nor do they ripen on trees. They fly almost 3,000 kilometers from their breeding grounds on the Arctic island of Svalbard, stopping just once until they reach the Solway. Their chicks must be ready in time to undertake this grueling journey. So at only a few days, they are forced out of their nests in order to take a free fall jump down the steep cliff to the grassy fruit feeding grounds below. Many of them die. Whilst Barney chicks are so light and fluffy that they tend to bounce off the rocks, they are often met by a host of predators waiting to snap up an easy meal at the bottom. Those that make it must then fatten up on nutrient rich grass and insects so they have enough energy to fly to Scotland. Don't worry, this particular goose survives. So that any of the chicks survive the journey is almost miraculous. But this is a Svalbard story. The story of the Solway and the barnacle goose is one of a different kind of danger. A danger that saw the goose dwindle to a few hundred individuals at the end of the Second World War. Before avian flu, before the anthropogenic climate crisis had destroyed our habitats, there were guns. So wild fowling, that is the hunting and shooting of geese and ducks with guns, goes hand in hand with the Solway's history. And Peter Scott, the founder of the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust, was a frequent visitor to the Solway. Um, and the WWT Reserve at Calaverock is one of the strongholds of the Barney wintering. And Scott himself was a keen wildfowler and shot many geese over his lifetime before seeming to make an about turn and focus his efforts on conservation. He embodies the fundamental tension of the Solway, that humans and geese have lived alongside each other for centuries, but that relationship has not always been harmonious. And Peter Scott not only founded the WWT, he also invented the cannon net. And this explosive propelled net became key for capturing and ringing birds, notably geese, for conservation purposes. So once it became clear what a dire situation the barnacle goose was in, monitoring the surviving population through ringing was one of the methods used to bring about the turnaround. And in fact, the barnacle goose is one of the most monitored and studied bird species in the world, with some monitoring programs having lasted for over three decades. A dedicated team from the Netherlands head up to meet Alisund on Svalbard every breeding season to track population counts, spatial patterns, and ecosystem and climate change. They have watched the species pull back from the brink of just a few hundred individuals to a thriving population of over 40,000. Avian flu notwithstanding, the barnacle goose is one of conservation's great success stories. So I was drawn to the Solway for this reason. At a time of massive environmental destruction, extinction, habitat loss, climate change, here was hope. But the story of the Barney's success is well worn. Hunting bands on the Solway and Svalbard respectively in the 1950s was integral to the fox revival and the creation of dedicated reserves at Calaverock and Mershead on the Solway allowed the goose to feed undisturbed. As the Barney population grew, their foraging began to affect the local farms, destroying crops and raising the grass so dairy cows didn't have anything to eat come spring. Understandably, the farmers were angry. They wanted to be able to shoot the Barneys again, or at least control them. So in 1994, the Scottish government introduced the Solway Goose Management Scheme, which didn't allow for widespread barney culling, but did allow for non-lethal goose scaring. It also paid farmers a subsidy to keep some of their fields for barney feeding. And so these are some of the current goose regulations, which stipulates that only non-lethal quiet methods of scaring uh, geese can be used in the feeding zones um, and the buffer zones, um, which means no gas guns, no rope bangers, and if you do want to shoot the geese, um, you must be you must apply for a license, but these are quite difficult to get. 
So gas guns and rope bangers are quite common bird scaring devices that use explosives. And whilst they're not permitted by the goose management scheme in many cases, they do still get used. And I interviewed a local who spoke of sometimes hearing the bangs across the fields like fireworks. Quiet scaring doesn't work, the farmers say. The geese learn that there is no threat and return to the fields. And a 2017 government report on the success of the goose management scheme states its limitations. So on the Solway, there's been an increase in numbers and expansion of areas being heavily used with current numbers in excess of 40,000 Svalbard barnacle geese. That has resulted in increased goose density and an expansion in the areas used by geese, including into the areas out with the current scheme area. There have been requests for an extension to the current goose management scheme area and some license applications submitted to, present, to prevent agricultural damage. And this request was rejected due to costs um, and unwillingness to extend the scheme. And two licenses were applied for and have been issued to shoot small numbers of barnacle geese to prevent serious agricultural damage. But farmers privately worry that the goose management scheme payments will come to an end and they will be faced with a standoff between the geese and their livelihoods. And I spoke to one farmer whose fields were regularly full of barnies and who thought the scheme worked, but was concerned about the delicate balance that exists between conservationists, bird lovers, farmers, and government bodies. And he states, when the geese were at around 10,000, everybody got on. You know, they shot some, they're on the land, it was fine, no problem. But as they got protected more and more and they started to be here more and more, this this farm, we couldn't farm it without the goose payment. There's just so many geese on it. You know, if they go tomorrow, right, that's it. And he's referring here to the potential ending of the goose payments. We'll scare these geese with rockets and gas guns and shooting, and we'll keep them off the land because we have to. But that's going to accept, upset everybody. Explosives saturate the solar landscape. On a visit to Calaverock with a keen Barney watcher, he points out to me that the straight concrete paths were used to transport munitions during the world wars. War games were held on the shores using the wide flat expanse of the estuary as a buffer zone. And even today, the army training base at Kukubri hosts regular tank battles. When the red flags are flying along the shore, you can't access the beach. And I abandoned plans to walk there for this reason, given the unpredictable nature of the place and the possibility of an exploded ordnance. But the Solway waters themselves have not escaped explosives either. In the 1980s, the Ministry of Defense fired 30 tons of explosives containing uranium into the sea off the coast of Kukubri. Their excuse for this illegal act being that the explosives were placed there rather than dumped. And in her sound art piece on the event titled, The Sea Cannot Be Depleted, the artist and scholar Wallace Heim states, the firings were a rehearsal and were hostile fire on Hermland not only the infusion of nuclear waste into the wild sea, how can one understand the slow corrosion that remains? What does it mean for a place, a people, to cohere with the unseen objects of war? The Barneys are, are inextricably entangled with the history of explosives on the Solway Firth. They may have little to do with uranium shells, but their life worlds intersect with a landscape that has been curated by guns and munitions in various forms, and have seen their populations rise and fall with the use of explosives, either with or against them. So when Wallace Heim asks, what does it mean for a place to cohere with the unseen objects of war? She is grasping at exactly this, this intangible heritage of land ownership, buried histories, and a culture saturated with gunpowder. And while fouling is still enthusiastically practiced on the Solway, and Barneys are protected, of course, but other geese and fowl are not, Companies charge high prices for shooting trips where one might shoot a bag, which is a set amount of wildfowl, of geese and post the pictures proudly on social media. The local wildfowling groups are often powerful lobbyists with the government, making the case that their pastime is part of the cultural heritage of the Solway. And as I continued my walk, occasionally ducking into pubs, I heard rumors that the Victorian practice of punt gunning still took place. So punt gunning involves rigging a gun so big and heavy that it can't be carried by hand to a punt boat, as you can see in the picture. And the gunners punt silently into the estuary at dawn and open fire on the oblivious birds. And this usually results in a massacre. And shockingly, but also kind of understandably, it's Calaverock Reserve that issues permits for wildfowlers and punt gunners. 
It makes sense that they'd want to control a pastime that affects the wildlife of the region so violently, but I'm surprised all the same. One of the reserve wardens I speak to tells me it's more of a grin and bear it situation. The wildfowling culture is too embedded in the local heritage to ban it outright, so controls are the next best thing. The reserve only issues a certain number of permits per year, and shooting is only allowed at certain times. Only two permits for pump gunning were issued this year, but it's still a difficult thing to come to terms with for the reserve workers. And the warden tells me, most people, I think, don't know about it. They think it's something that's archaic or grown out of fashion. We issue permits for it, but I don't agree with it or comprehend it at all. It's very indiscriminate. You can't say I want to shoot that one bird in flight. It's like a big cannon. So it's multiple shots with quite a wide spread. And now you can't use lead shot in the wetlands in Scotland. But lead shot's softer, so it kind of warps when it hits things. It warps in the barrel of the gun, so it has less impact. Steel, the metal they use now, is harder, so it doesn't lose its velocity. So it might hit you or a goose, go through it, and then hit another one or injure another one. You get a lot of cripples and lots of injuries to geese and ducks, which is just horrible to see. It used to be a big part of my job, kind of monitoring that and trying to stop the worst practice activities. They're allowed to go there. They've got licenses, shot licenses, insurance, whatever. But proving that they've done something wrong is quite challenging. So on the island of Isla in the Hebrides, it is permitted to shoot barnacle geese. The island is also under the goose management scheme and farmers receive payments to manage their fields for the geese, but they are allocated a percentage to shoot, to keep their numbers in check. These are barnies from Greenland and they arrive later and leave earlier than the Svalbard geese. But the farmers there say they are still fighting the losing battle, which you can tell by the headline. They should be allowed to shoot more barnies. And to those in the Solway who aren't allowed to control numbers at all, this can of course be quite galling. And several people I talked to spoke of the island bias of the scheme, a sort of unfair disadvantage to, be, to being attached to the mainland. But what it revealed to me though, was the Solway's unique landscape, not just in its materiality, but also in the way it is spatialized by its tides, its in-between zones, its military infrastructure, its goose scheme managed farmlands of feeding zones and buffer areas, its wetland reserves. The specific patchwork of heterogeneous land use curates how the geese are permitted to use certain spaces and barred from others. It's a particular history that encompasses all kinds of military activity from the munitions factory to the firing range. It's a particular history of the barnacle goose too. The Solway Barneys have had a different trajectory to the Greenland population. Their numbers are quite significantly less and they have come closer to the brink of devastation after the Second World War. And they are beloved by many of the people who live on the Solway. And so many people I talked to with, spoke of their joy of hearing the first Barneys flying in, honking against the autumn skies. They symbolize the coming of winter, the shifting of the seasons that will bring in violent storms and mists of the Solway. This is a landscape of memory, of cyclical time, of conjuring up ghosts. The Barneys may now be protected from guns, but their histories of entanglement with the wildfowling culture in the area remains a potent reminder of how explosives have defined the Solway. Explosives comprise intangible registers that haunt the fuzzy boundaries of what space is assigned to what thing. Munitions are no longer made at the devil's porridge, but they once were. Bird bangers are not used in the feeding zones, but they are elsewhere, and come the 1st of April, they are permissible. Punt guns and rifles are controlled through permits and zones, but their historical legacy lingers on. Whatever spatial boundaries are constructed through fences, maps, policy documents, are frequently transgressed by the liveliness of the geese and others. The invisible in-between zones rendered visible and tangible. And so my point is that it is impossible to tell the Barney story without also telling the story of the Solway's explosive presence. But both the goose and the explosives that have spatialized and shaped their livelihoods might bleed out beyond the region, but will always return, as the Barneys do in the winter, as ghostly resonances. And I didn't understand this until I went to the Solway myself, until I found my route shaped by blasted landscapes, by spent shotgun shells, by bunkers recolonized by nat natterjack toads, by the fencing off of MOD land. And just like the nuclear waste that will remain suspended in the Solway for centuries, the sea does not forget what has gone before, nor will it forget what is to come. And I'd like to end this talk by another excerpt from a poem 
the swan by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Burns. Above the estuary, the pale moon shifts and the tide, like a bale of cloth unfolded, is pulled towards the land, a swathe of rippled silk spilling over sand, easing under the hulls of fishing boats and brushing the tips of bulrushes, edging inland as far as it can reach, until, gathered into narrowed earthbound arms, seawater blurs into a river, a rush of it flowing from Galloway Hills down into this salt mouth that it floods with fresh water, licking at the briny tongue until the dawn, when, drawn by the moon's odd magnet, the tide slips back towards the shore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. 